A reading from the Hebrew Bible, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, redeeming one. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away. Then you comforted me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not fear. For Yah, she who is God, is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. Then you all shall with joy draw water from the wells of salvation. And you all shall say in that day, give thanks to the God of our salvation. Call on God's name. Acclaim God's deeds among the nations. Make known that God's name is exalted. Sing praises to the mighty God who has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. For the word of God in its promise and covenant, thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us on this adventure, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us on this adventure, then nothing else matters. Guide us to thy perfect light, we pray. Amen. Readers and preachers seeking more traditional Advent readings for all four Sundays of Advent will find them in years A, C, and W. I pause homiletically and insert parenthetically that year C has not yet been released, but I digress. That first sentence, though, is the last sentence of Dr. Gaffney's concluding paragraph in Year B volume of her women's lectionary for the whole church. Year B, which begins today, is typically the Gospel of Mark's year, supplemented by John. But Mark has no announcement to Mary from God's messenger and no birth narratives. Jesus is already an adult at the beginning of Mark, which presents a problem for Advent. More traditional readings for the season may be preferred. And yet, no matter the lectionary we are using, the Hebrew Bible readings are typically my favorite. Isaiah is a common choice for Advent readings, but we will be in Genesis for Advent 2 and 3, and I guarantee you, you will, as I did, ask a question, perhaps lots and lots of questions, including who chose these texts and what does this text have to do with the coming of the Christ child and where are my Christmas carols? (laughs) We'll get there, I promise. We'll take this adventure one day, one week at a time. And we will arrive on time to greet the babe of Bethlehem. Advent is a compound word of sorts. Ad, a preposition meaning to, and then a verb, the Latin venio. Quite literally, Advent means to come or to come toward. Though I'm not the first one to come up with this idea, Advent and adventure have the same etymology. But I started to wonder what would be different for us if we understood Advent as not a countdown to Christmas Day, but rather a holy adventure 
through a time in which there is lengthening darkness and diminishing sunshine. Without a doubt, our use of these unfamiliar and new yet ancient biblical texts will be for us a wondrous adventure. Dr. Gaffney writes, this year's Advent theme is salvation. In the Hebrew scriptures, salvation is corporate. Though some individuals, notably in the Psalms, experienced individual deliverance from difficulty and danger, salvation was understood as deliverance for the whole community, the entire people. Isaiah 12 is the praise song of a people looking forward to the day of their liberation, imagining the song they will sing on that day. They are so certain of their redemption, they are already writing the lyrics to their redemption song. I like that. They are so confident in the future God wants and ultimately will have that they're already singing that new world into being. Salvation, liberation, redemption, take your pick of which word, but all three are an adventure. They are never sudden or immediate. Adventures take time, lots and lots of time. Sometimes we feel that the adventure never ends. We arrive only to start again on faith's unwinding way. One place we cannot stay. Or to paraphrase Ruth Duck's line, the journey, the adventure, not the destination, is our home. Think of the numerous adventures through Scripture. God calls Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your parents' house to the land that I will show you. No maps, no compass, no GPS, just a divine promise. Then there's God's liberation of the Hebrew children through Moses That was an adventure, not only for those enslaved persons, but also for Pharaoh. Sometimes adventures lead to differing ends. Imagine traveling alongside Jesus as one of his disciples. What an adventure that must have been. With all of its hope and with all of its angst, uncertainty, and confusion, Now we prepare for the one who is to come again, but as if for the very first time. And our preparation will not be idle waiting, but hopeful, hope-filled anticipation. Our journey could or maybe will be the adventure of a lifetime. Most of you have picked up on my obsession with grammar, and if you haven't, um, I'll pray for you. Um, The most recent installment in sermons of grammatical theology was when we had the outreach fair at the end of August. That morning, the entire sermon hinged on the definite article, the, or the, I had not paid attention to that definite article in the Greek, but it's interesting when it appears before the word love and before Jesus. Reverend Dr. Kevin Henson, one of the directors of development at Bright Divinity School, was with us in worship that day and fact-checked me during the sermon on his iPhone. Hours after worship, he came clean and said, I pulled up the Greek on my iPhone and was curious to see that definite article, and sure enough, it is there. While in English the definite article may not seem important, it does help us understand that the authors are talking about a specific love, 
or about the specific Jesus. Because any other love or any other Jesus just will not do. Several weeks before that, on Trinity Sunday, a clergy colleague who is a member here, whose name I will not mention, uh, she remarked to me, I've never heard a sermon preached on the Oxford comma. We know God as the creator, comma, the redeemer, comma, and the sustainer. There are not many things to which I pledge allegiance these days, but the Oxford comma is one. If you attended the first iteration of Bible Burger and Beer at the Foundry Bar and Grill, you will remember the amount of time we spent wrestling with the prepositions in and of. Is it the faith in Jesus Christ or the faith of Jesus Christ? I'm thrilled to report that the NRSV updated edition, which came out in 2021, chose of. There is much theology in a single, simple preposition. When I met with the search committee for the Grand Inquisition interview in May 2018, we gathered in the elders' conference room. I cannot remember what I said exactly, but I used the word y'all, and Kimberly Wilhelm responded, aw, he used y'all. What can I say, guilty as charged. Pronouns are vitally important in scripture. I remember the first time when I learned that some 90% of the times the word you is used in scripture, that it is plural. It should be translated, y'all. For example, Jesus said, I am the vine, y'all are the branches. But there are other pronouns, pronoun uses in Scripture that are quite fascinating. Consider Genesis 1.26, in which God says, let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness. So according to this text, God is not singular, but plural. In Exodus chapter 3, the narrator says, There the messenger of the Holy One appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush, but then a voice speaks to Moses saying, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But if, as the narrator suggests, a messenger of the Holy One appeared, how is it exactly that this messenger uses the pronoun I? Was it God all along, or as Dr. Gaffney is famous for saying, God in drag? One of my favorite Bible stories of all time occurs in Acts chapter 8. A person who is Ethiopian by birth and a eunuch, by means we do not know, encounters Philip, and there is a baptism. Except the Greek says, he baptized him. In English, we call that a vague pronoun reference. But I wonder if the author of Acts did not pull a fast one on us by saying he baptized him by using pronouns. We're left to explore our curiosity. Who baptized whom? Or perhaps they baptized each other into new understandings, new possibilities, new adventures. For some time now, you've heard both Glennis and I introduce ourselves at the beginning of worship, and we name our pronouns, not our pronoun preferences, our pronouns, period. Sometimes you see people list their pronouns in their email signatures, which can be helpful to if you have a name like Casey or Noah. 
Pronouns matter not only in Scripture, but in human relationships. According to the National Education Association, addressing someone by the wrong name or misgendering them by using incorrect pronouns can feel disrespectful, harmful, and even threatening to a gender-diverse person. Misgendering results in marginalization and communicates that a person's identity is not seen as important. When correct names and pronouns are used, statistics show that suicide rates drop, while trust and feelings of belonging increase. It's also a sign of respect. Pronouns affirm gender identities and create safe spaces by referring to people in the way that feels most accurate to them. Upon entering the building today, you may have noticed the new display board in the hallway, which Susan and Mark Mathis created yesterday. There is a poster which says, love your neighbor who does not look like you, think like you, love like you, speak like you, pray like you, vote like you. Love your neighbor, no exceptions. In addition, on that display board, there are differing keywords and pronouns like she, they, and they, them. And words like allyship and advocacy. Next week and again on December 17th, Glennis has organized safe zone training for us. We will learn more about how to be intentionally welcoming, inclusive, and expansive in our use of language. Together we will explore our curiosities, ask good questions, and explore our attitudes and biases, which we all have. This, too, will be an adventure for us as we prepare for the one or the ones who are to come. In the passage from Isaiah, pronouns play an interesting role. A messenger says, you, singular, will say in that day. Who the messenger is, we don't know, but I have a sneaking suspicion. Second, the person to whom the messenger is speaking is not known, but I'd like to think that they are a singer, a soprano maybe, but that's my bias. The singer composes a new hymn, a song of ecstatic praise. I will give thanks to you, redeeming one. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not fear for Yah, she who is, God is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. Dr. Gaffney's translation is wondrous here. If we think of the divine name that we dare not pronounce, the tetragrammaton, as it is called in Hebrew, the translated, uh, transliterated consonants of Y-H-W-H, the first syllable is Yah. It's the same in the word Hallelujah. It's an abbreviation, a nickname. It'd be like calling me Nate, except I should warn you. <clears throat> calling me that will get you on my naughty list pretty fast. Yah, interestingly enough, is, according to its grammatical form, feminine. Though it takes masculine verbs in biblical Hebrew. The Holy One, Yah, she who is, they who are, has differing, fluid, gender. Of this we can say of the Holy One, they do not conform to gender binaries. God is fluid in their expression of gender. 
There is a final pronoun shift in this poem from Isaiah. A messenger says to the individual, you will. And then the recipient sings, I will. But a couple verses later, the singer changes and says, you all, y'all shall with joy draw water from the wells of salvation. And y'all shall say in that day, give thanks to the God of our salvation, call on God's name, acclaim God's deed among the nations, make known that God's name is exalted, sing praises to the mighty God who has done gloriously. Y'all let this be made known in all the earth. What was at first personal, personal, cannot stay private. It has to become public. Here, there is a holy transition from singular to plural, from the individual to the universal. The singer hopes against hope. They hope in spite of evidence to the contrary. Their hope is not cheap optimism, but faithful confidence in the promises of God. Such hope has to be shared. Such hope has to be pursued. Such hope is an adventure in the making. This past week, the Pastoral Relations Committee and I met, and while our gatherings are confidential, I want to share with you, the the church, a few things I shared with them. Recently, Pastoral ministry has felt heavier than ever. I have been nervous and anxious about the upcoming sabbatical, not because I don't think y'all can do it without me, but because I want to be sure that I've conveyed all the tools that I think you'll both want and need. In summary, I've been discouraged. It's not your fault, nor is my discouragement yours to fix. And yet I do think there is value in authenticity. I am your pastor, but let me tell you that I do not have it all figured out, not even close. Maybe you have similar anxieties and fears too. Life is really complex, complicated, and a hard right now. The holidays are coming and sometimes family gatherings can make our blood pressure rise to 200. We had a rough November here at Washington Avenue with three funerals. There are upcoming doctor's appointments, changes in prescription drug plans, Cars that need repair, a fuse that blew again on the Christmas tree in the big window. These things add up. They pile up and they feel heavy. The Pastoral Relations Committee was helpful to me in many ways. For things for which I feel more responsibility than I should, they said, it's not your fault. The things that I'm anxious about resolving or completing, they said, you will be okay. The church will be okay. Now, they didn't say this exactly, but they might as well have said, you cannot see it all yet. Neither can we. But that's okay. Not knowing is a good place to begin. Maybe we're not supposed to. To know. But you, Nathan, will say in that day, you will sing, I will give thanks to you, redeeming one. Another friend texted me this week saying, I'm wishing you vitality for Advent. Surprises await. Friend, a committee, a church, is someone who knows the lyrics to the song in your heart 
We can sing them back to you when you have forgotten the words. And then Sunday comes, and the singer preacher is called again to proclaim the word of God for the people of God. And they say, joyfully, y'all are going to pull up buckets of water from the wells of salvation. And as you do it, y'all will say, give thanks to God. Call out their name. Ask the Holy One anything. Shout from y'all's doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Tell them what the Holy One, our liberator, has done. Spread the news of this divine reputation. Sing praise songs to the composer of all. And when we do that, a weary world will rejoice once more. Though we cannot see it yet, let's sing to use this Advent waiting. Let's sing to prepare for the future God wants and ultimately will have. Maybe the more we sing of that coming day, the sooner it will be here. What could be more hopeful and more adventurous than that?